Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Ray, and today we're going to talk about sequences and series, specifically arithmetic sequences and series. There's a little bit of vocabulary we need to get through here. First of all, what is a sequence? Well, a sequence is just what it sounds like. It's a sequence of numbers, and a sequence would just be denoted by numbers separated by commas. The dot 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 indicates that whatever the pattern we did to get these first four terms in the sequence, we will continue that pattern indefinitely. That would be an infinite sequence. We can also have a finite sequence, which would stop after a certain number of terms. A series in mathematics is what we get when we sum up the terms of a sequence. This can be an infinite sum, as in the case here, where we're going to add the first four terms, and then this dot, dot, dot indicates that we'll continue adding all of the terms forever. Or we can have a finite sequence where we would say, perhaps have a dot, 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 and then a plus a sub 17, and that would be the last term that we add. These subscripts here, the 1, 2, 3, 4, that indicates the first, the second, the third, the fourth term, etc. in the series. We would re read that as a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. What makes this an arithmetic sequence or series is that the way we get from one term to the next is by adding the same amount every time. So for example, if I started with the number 4 and then I added 3 to 4, so that would be a 7, and then I added 3 again to 7, that would give me a 10, and so on, this would be an arithmetic sequence. Over here, the 4 plus 7 plus 10 plus 13, right? this is an arithmetic series because we are adding the terms. Now what makes this arithmetic is that there's a common difference between all of the terms. In this case, that difference was 3. We usually use the lowercase letter d to represent the common difference in an arithmetic series or sequence. And all that means is that the way we get from one term to the next is we add that common difference. So a sub 2 would be equal to a sub 1 plus d. How would I get to a sub 3? Well, a sub 3 is equal to a sub 2 plus that same d, but that means that it would be a sub 1 plus 2d. a sub 1 plus the first d would be a sub 2, add another d and you get to a sub 3. a sub 4, we would have to add one more d, so it would be a sub 1 plus 3d, and hopefully you're starting to see a pattern develop here. The pattern that is starting to develop is what we call the general term of an arithmetic sequence. So if I want to know what the general term is, in other words, what's a sub n for some sequence? Well, a sub n, in other words, the nth term, is going to be a sub 1, the first term, plus I have to add some number of those common differences, that d. The question is how many? Well, if we go back to that last screen, notice that a sub 2 was 1d added to a sub 1. a sub 3 was 2 of those d added to a sub 1. a sub 4 was 3 of them, and so on. Then what happens is it's always the n minus 1 times d. In other words, if you want to get to the nth term, that means you started at a sub 1, and you had to make n minus 1 jumps to get to a sub n. Where each one of those jumps, we are simply adding d. If you add n minus 1 of them, you'll get to the nth term. This allows us to predict any term of an arithmetic sequence. So here's a pretty standard question. We could ask, is this sequence arithmetic? The way to figure that out is to look at a pair of adjacent terms. So a sub 1 and a sub 2 here, if I take a sub 2 and I subtract a sub 1, then I get 11. So this is the common difference between those two terms. The question is, is that the same between all the other two terms? So for example, if I look at 28 to 39, yes, we also get 11. So that's the same difference. And in fact, any two of these pairs of numbers, you'll get the same difference. So yes, this is arithmetic, and the common difference is 11 between each pair of terms. So what's the general term? Well, if I wanted to know the nth term in this sequence, that's just going to be the first term plus n minus 1 times the common difference. Or in this case, that would be 6, because that's the first term in the sequence, plus n minus 1 times 11. And that will generate the a sub nth term for this sequence. We can also distribute that out, so that's a little bit cleaner way to express the a sub nth term, that general term of the sequence. Now that we know the general term, then we can figure out any term of the sequence that we want. So if we wanted the 50th term, that would just be 11 times 50 minus 5, which is 545. What about these two numbers? What if we wanted to know is 325 in this sequence? All we need to do is set 325 equal to 11 times some number n minus 5 and see if there's a number n that will solve this. We get n equals 30. 325 is a sub 
30. Notice that n has to be an integer. The n is actually the number of times that we add the common difference. That n always needs to be an integer. Is 761 in the sequence? We can do the same thing. We can set 761 equal to 11n minus 5, n would be 69.6363 repeating. So 761 is not in the sequence, right? There's no integer value of n that will get me from 6 to 761 if I'm adding 11 each time. So here's an arithmetic sequence where the first three terms are actually given as expressions, or at least the first two. So this is our a sub 1 here, this is our a sub 2, and this is our a sub 3. They want us to solve for k. In other words, what's this variable here? Well, what do we know about a sub 1, 2, and 3? They have to have a common difference. In other words, if I were to take k and subtract 3k plus 1, that would have to be the same as if I took negative 3 and subtracted k. And then this is just some algebra. We can solve this here. So solving this for k gives us the value of k equal to 2. Now we can check this answer very easily by plugging it back in. If k is 2, then 3 times k plus 1 is 7. And then we would have k, which is 2. And then we would have the negative 3 as the third term. So is this arithmetic, right? What's the difference there? Negative 5. What's the difference there? Negative 5. So yes, this is an arithmetic sequence with common difference equal to negative 5. If these were not arithmetically different, then you would know you made a mistake in your algebra here, and you can just go back and fix that. Once we know the common difference, if we want to find the 26th term of the sequence, we can simply use the general formula. We know that a sub 26 is going to be a sub 1 plus 26 minus 1 times the common difference, in this case of negative 5. a sub 1 is 7 plus 25 times negative 5. And we get that the 26th term is negative 118. So just because an arithmetic sequence is achieved by adding a common difference doesn't mean the terms will always be positive. If that difference is negative, then we'll work down and down and down. And we can also start with negative terms and add something positive, and it'll eventually become positive, but it has to start off negative. In this question, they're asking us to find the general term, u sub n. So that's like a sub n, but they're using u here instead of a. Given that u sub 3 is a and u sub 8 is negative 17. Okay. Well, how can we figure out what the common difference is? In order to get from 8 to here, we need to add one of those common differences, right? So each of these represents adding that same common difference. I need five of those to get to negative 17. So that gives us an equation. 8 plus 5d has to be equal to negative 17. And if we solve that for d, we get d is equal to negative 5. Now we need to write the general term. In order to find the general term, we also need to know the first term. Well, that's pretty easy to find if we just work backwards, right? If adding d moves us to the right, then subtracting d will move us to the left. So by subtracting that common difference twice, we can get back to u sub 1 from u sub 3. Be careful here. Since our d is negative 5, when we subtract it, we're actually going to be adding 5 each time, which means we're adding 10 altogether, and the first term of this sequence is 18. That means that the general term, u sub n, is going to be the first term, 18, plus n minus 1 times that common difference of negative 5. We can distribute this out, so we end up with a general term of 23 minus 5n. And it would be a great idea, as always, to check this. How can we check that this works? Let's see if it works for u sub 8. If I plug in an 8 here, that would be 5 times 8, which is 40. So we have 23 minus 40, and indeed that gets us to negative 17, which is what the 8th term should be. So we can feel pretty good about that answer. Up until now, we've been playing with just looking at the terms and finding a specific term in the sequence or finding the common difference or the first term. But we can also take a look at the partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. So what this means is if I had a sequence like, say, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., even numbers here, I could ask the question, what happens if I instead sum these all the way up to, say, 50, right? Is there an easy way to work out what this sum is. This would be the sum of the first 25 terms of this sequence, if you think about this being a sub 1, and of course we're going to add 2 each time until we get to 50, that would be a sub 25, and we call this capital S sub 25. This is the partial sum, in other words the sum of the first 25 terms of the sequence. So in order to work this out, we actually are going to do something pretty clever. Let's say I wanted to find the partial sum of the first n terms of a sequence. That's just a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus, and then we have to keep going until we get to a sub n minus 2 
plus a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n. So take a minute to convince yourself that those are the first n terms of a sequence, where if a sub n is the last term, then this would be the a sub n minus 1 and the a sub n minus 2 term. In order to figure out what this is, we're going to do something pretty clever. We're going to put it underneath itself, and we're going to add them, but we're going to write the second one backwards. So instead of starting at a sub 1, I'm going to start at a sub n. And then I'm going to work backwards. So this would be a sub n minus 1. This would be a sub n minus 2. And then we'll keep going all the way down to a sub 3 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 1. Now, if you haven't seen this before, this is really, really cool. If we add these two equations together, over on the left-hand side, we would have 2 times s sub n which notice is just double what we're looking for, right? We want the sum of the first n terms. If we add these two, we'll get double that number. But here's where it gets interesting. a sub 1 plus a sub n. Okay, well, that's a sub 1 plus a sub n. But what is a sub 2 plus a sub n minus 1? a sub 2 is just 1d larger than a sub 1. And a sub n minus 1 is 1d smaller than a sub n. So if this term goes up by d, and this term goes down by d, when we add them together, won't we get exactly what we got here, a sub 1 plus a sub n? And doesn't the same logic hold for the next pair? If a sub 3 is 2d more than a sub 1, and a sub n minus 2 is 2d less than a sub n, then won't these two also add up to that very same amount, a sub 1 plus a sub n? And the same is true for the next pair, and the next pair, and the next pair. It's really easy to see at the end here, this one literally is a sub 1 plus a sub n once again. But every single one of these pairs of terms that are being added is going to have the same sum. That sum is always going to be a sub 1 plus a sub n. So the only question then is, how many of these do we have? So aren't there n of these pairs of numbers that we're adding together? Right? We're going to have n pairs here. And every single one of those pairs has the same sum. In other words, this whole right-hand side is just a sub 1 plus a sub n times n. That's it. This is a very clever bit of mathematics. And if we solve this for s sub n, which is what we wanted in the first place, we get that s sub n, the sum of the first n terms in any arithmetic sequence, is simply n times a sub 1 plus a sub n, that quantity, divided by Two. If we wanted to find, say, the sum of the first 50 terms of an arithmetic sequence, then we know that the sum of the first 50 is going to be 50 times a sub 1 plus a sub n divided by 2. So a sub 1 we know, right? A sub 1 is 4, so it's 50 times 4 plus the last term divided by 2. Well, in order to find the last term, we just need to use what we did before. So 4 plus 3 will get us 7, plus 3 will get us 10, plus 3 will get us 13. So the common difference here is 3. In order to find the 50th term, a sub 50, that would just be a sub 1 plus 49 of the common difference. In this case, that is the number 4 plus 49 times 3. And that ends up being 151. So once we know that a sub 50 is 151, we can plug that into our formula. The sum of the first 50 terms is 3,875. This is a pretty classic application of an arithmetic sequence or series problem. So we're building a triangular brick wall, and they're telling us that the wall contains a total of 171 bricks. Well, that's the sum of the first n terms of this sequence. Right? We don't know how many terms there are, but it's the sum. Now, how do I know it's an arithmetic sequence? Look at the wall. You've got one brick. In the next row, you have two bricks. And then you have three bricks. And then you have four bricks. Right, so this is a pretty classic arithmetic sequence. It is simply the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4. The common difference is 1. We're adding 1 each time. And at some point, we're going to accumulate 171 bricks. The question is, how many rows of bricks will the wall contain? Well, that's asking us to find n. Right? What is n if we know that the sum of the first n terms is 171? In order to find this, we're going to go back to our partial sum formula. So what do we know here? We know what the sum is. It is 171. We don't know what n is, so that's the thing we're looking for. a sub 1 is 1 plus a sub n over 2. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute. We've got two unknowns in this equation. And you're kind of right. We don't certainly don't know what n is. That's what we're trying to find. And we don't know what the last term is either. 
but we know something about the last term. What's another way that I could write a sub n? Isn't that just a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times the common difference? That's the definition of an arithmetic sequence. In other words, we have 1 plus n minus 1, which is just n. If we think about it, we actually knew that, right? Because these were the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, of course, the fifth term is 5, and the sixth is 6, and so on. But if this was any other sequence, this little trick will get you an expression you can use for n. So in this case, we can simply reduce this to 171 is equal to n times 1 plus n over 2. And I think I'll just clean up my workspace a little bit here. So now I'm simply going to take this equation and solve it. Cross multiplying and working that out, we get a quadratic in terms of n. Of course, you could use the quadratic formula here, but we know this is going to have to factor because n needs to be an integer value. Since 342 is negative, we need one of these numbers to be positive and one of them to be negative. If you grab a calculator, you'll pretty quickly find that 18 and 19 work. This one will give us a negative solution, which of course we will ignore. And this will give us a positive solution. That's the one that we're looking for. So we can't have negative because of course then we'll be going backwards in the series. But the positive term will give us the solution we're looking for. There are 18 rows of bricks. This is kind of an interesting one. So what if we're looking for the multiples of 7 between 0 and 200? So if you think about multiples of 7, this is an arithmetic sequence. The common difference, of course, is 7. So what we're looking for is the sum all the way up until we cap at 200. So we're going to need to figure out what's the largest multiple of 7 that is before 200. So let me go in a little, little thought bubble over here. 200 divided by 7. Well, that means that the most I can multiply 7 by and still be under 200 is 28. So 7 times 28 would get me 196, which means that's the largest multiple of 7 that's still less than 200. This is the series of terms that we're looking to add. But now we need to know how many terms that is. We know that a sub 1 is 7. What we're missing is the number of terms. A nice simple way to do this would be to simply divide everything by 7. That is the n that we're looking for. So now that we know that n equals 28, and we know the sum of the first 28 terms is going to be 28 times a sub 1, 7, plus a sub n, 196. All of that divided by 2, and that works out to 2,842 in this case. What if I wanted to find the sum of multiples of 7 between 100 and 500? First, we need to find the first number that's going to be bigger than 100. That's 105. I'll do the same thing with 500, but 71 sevens will be 497, and that'll fit nicely between 100 and 500. So this is going to be my a sub 1, my first term, and this is going to be my last term, a sub n, but that's a sub what? Well, if this term, this first term, is actually 15 sevens, and this nth term is actually 71 sevens, we can simply take the difference of those. 71 minus 15, 56. This is the 56th term in the sequence. So this is going to be the sum of the first 56 terms of the sequence which has this as the first term, this as the 56th term, and the common difference is 7, although that doesn't really matter because it'll be taken care of by these terms. Plugging that into the calculator, we get, well, we get exactly 16,856. One final problem I want to look at with you. So if I wanted to find the sum of the integers between 100, 1, and 100, which are not divisible by 3, it would be really easy to find the sum of the numbers that are divisible by 3. Let's actually start there. Find the sum of the numbers that are divisible by 3. Well, that's an arithmetic sequence. Uh, we can see that there are 33 terms here, since this is 3 times 1. And this is 3 times 33, which means I can find the sum by taking the sum of the first 33 terms. So that's the sum of all the numbers that are divisible by 3. Does that give you an idea about how to find the sum of the numbers which are not divisible by 3? What if we find the sum of all numbers between 1 and 100? That would be the sum of the first 100 terms of a sequence that begins with 1 and ends at 100. That works out to be 50, 50, 5,050. So if I want the sum of the numbers that are not divisible by 3, that's the sum of all numbers from 1 to 100, and this is the sum of all of the ones that are divisible by 3, then if I take those out, all I'll be left with is the numbers that are not divisible by 3, and that would be 3367. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.